All right, good evening, zoology people. Uh, here to get into our discussion on Saria. All right, so again, one of my just favorite topics to, to cover. Uh, we've already discussed the testudines, all the turtles, all their neat characteristics. Um, for this next bit on the reptilia, the saurians, we're gonna focus on what we call the lepidosauria, uh, which are the squamata, the rhynchocephalians, um, lizards, snakes, the tuatara, that's what this, uh, this group entails. So the way I'm gonna attack the lecture right now is kind of like merging, kind of blending what we would have covered in lab, um, all of the diversity, the different types of, of uh, the different families, different specimens, different species. Uh, and then the sort of the theory behind some of, you know, just the natural history of, of some of the groups here, right? So uh, again, as much as I love talking about this, it just, it's not the same actually having the lab, working with these in, in live, uh, with live specimens going out into the field, looking at them in their natural habitat. But again, we got to work with what we have. So uh, I'll try to do the best I can, blending, merging uh, the lab and the lecture content within this Saurian group here. So uh, we, we've talked about our sort of our phylogeny here, the reptiles, which include our turtles, our archosaurian group, which we haven't covered, we're going to get to after the break here. Uh, so we know that this is a very uh, early separation. The turtles deviated very early in this trajectory here. Right? So now we're up here in this group, the Pitosaurians, where we're going to discuss our squamate group, which will include our uh, snakes, lizards, and then that first deviation, this blue line, which is the rhynchocephalians, the tuatara. So they're uh, just a very primitive group. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on them. They look like lizards. If you see them externally, that looks like a lizard. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, skeletal differences, uh, very sort of primitive uh, skeletal structure that they have. Uh, behaviorally, they're different. They're very cold tolerant species. Um, so just strange, very primitive branch, this rhynchocephalian group, the tuataras off of our Lepidosaurian groups. But most of this discussion now will focus on the squamates. Um, I'm going to actually look at the lizards first and then we'll move over to the snakes here. So Lepidosauria, um, this is going to be a very diverse group, right? So it's going to have about 6,500 species of lizards, uh, about 3,600 3, species of snakes, um, and again that one tuatara group, the tuatara group. When we talk about Lepidosauria, um, we know lizards have four well-developed legs, very capable of running, but we do see some reduction in some species. So we have the four limbs, like the mini lizards have the four limbs, Tuatara had the four limbs. We have a reduction in the four limbs, and we see this with a lot of the skink species. So these are some skinks, skincella. We have, again, tiny little legs. Um, and then we start to see the loss of limbs. So these are some of the pygopodon lizards. Um, Lialis, we start to see just like little flaps, almost like little fins uh, of that sort of uh, limbed type of biology. And then we know when we get to the snakes, uh, snakes are limbless, right? They don't have any legs at all. So it's just a neat um, multiple evolutionary sort of uh, occurrence that has happened, either leg reduction or absence of legs. And we're going to get to, uh, to details as we go through the lecture. And then obviously when we cover snakes, they're all legless there. So lots of diversity, right? And again, I'm not doing this justice. I'm, I'm just highlighting a couple of the, the very common, uh, well-known or very interesting types of families. So uh, we look at our Lepidosauria group and there's our squamata. So got chopped off here, but this is rhynchocephalia, that first tuatara group. And the lizards, I'm just going to kind of cover family by family as they exist on this phylogenetic tree. Right? So we start to see that first branch, which are the iguanidae. Uh, we'll, call, we'll cover the iguanidae, a little bit of the agamids, uh, amphisbanids, uh, euglepharids, geconidae, pagopodidae, 
um, skin day, uh, cordillera day, anguilla day, dramatic day, and barana day. Right? So these are the extant lizards. We have some dinosaur fossils, and then we start to see the snakes, serpentes, uh, which will kind of cover in another lecture. But right now we're going to focus on the lizard diversity. Um, again, had we been in lab, we would have these sort of live specimens or preserved specimens, um, and we would then kind of start to see uh, visually what are some distinctions and maybe behaviorally. Uh, we analyze some skeletal characteristics. Uh, but again, I try to piece together a very um, colorful presentation here that, that, try to, that tries to highlight uh, some of the main characteristics of each of these lizard groups. So most people are familiar with iguanas, right? This is a very big family of lizards. Um, when you think of a lizard, usually it's going to be in the iguanid family. Right? Uh, uh, we have uh, the just iguana, iguana, that colorful uh, iguana. We have collar lizards. We have um, swifts. We have little uh, uh, spiny crevice lizards. We, we have all of most of the, the, the common lizards uh, that you know of or you've seen typically fall within this category, the iguanids. So it's like a little miniature T-Rex here, these little guys here. Um, a lot of the iguanids are very colorful, very dynamic. Um, they're not real shy necessarily. Um, they'll be out, they'll be basking, trying to thermoregulate. They start to do these really neat displays, uh, the males. We'll kind of use their colorful throat fans. They start to do push-ups, and, and it's just their their need to observe behaviorally, right? These iguanids. Um, moving on downwards, right? We have another neat group we call the Phrynosomatidae, right? The horn lizards. Again, these are really cool, right? Real, real fascinating groups. Um, horny toads are called sometimes, but they're, again, they're not amphibians. They're lizards. They have that very keratinized, uh, thick skin but they take that a step further, they have now actual thorns. Right? So they have these little thorny bodies. I uh, have um, a little example just to kind of show you here, if you can see that close to the camera, um, showing you kind of what they would look like in a natural realistic size. Little camouflage pattern on the back. Right, little spikes in the forehead. Again, these are the the Phrynosomatids, the horned lizards. Uh, the Texas horned lizard, right, uh, neat little guy, very dominant head spikes. We find these in the El Paso area. Uh, these are interesting because they feed on ants, so that they're very specific on the types of foods they eat. Um, and as far as their food source, a lot of people don't like to have ants running around their home and their yard, so they poison the ants. Um, and as the ant populations uh, these big uh, harvester ant populations start to decrease. The food source decreases, and a lot of these horned lizards also um, have to kind of disperse out of the city. And, and again, some of their numbers are, are kind of dwindling because of um, lack of food, fire ants, and then also invasive, uh, I should say, lack of food, the big harvester ants, and then the invasive fire ants that are um, now brought into this area as well. So eh, they're having a little bit of a challenge, like many other species in the world today. Um, a lot of them are desert forms. Uh, these camouflage into the rocks. Uh, we do have some sort of montane forms. If you go up to the uh, cloud croft area, not to the very top, but the, the beginning of the forest, low forest, uh, we can go to the Guadalupe Mountains. We can go to uh, just more montane areas of the Gila forest, and you can start to find these as well. So within its natural habitat. Uh, as far as weird modifications, weird anti-predatory defense mechanisms go, I think these win a, a top prize. So very rarely do we see um, a, a, a defense that involves blood, right? So in the way it's sort of uh, initiated, uh, little capillaries in the eyes start to rupture and literally, literally streams of, of blood can can shoot out. So I'll, I'll link up a video that will elaborate on this a little bit more, uh, but strange, right? Strange and, and neat all, all together, these little um, phrynosomatid lizards here. Um, here in, in the new world in the United States, in the United States, Mexico, we have uh, the phrynosomatids, 
find a soulmate. It's kind of really fascinating to me, but if we were to go to Australia, right? A long way away, isolated geographically, biogeographically, um, a very similar ecological strategy has developed. It's a very different species, different family. Uh, we're going to call this the thorny devil, or Moloch, right? But it has adapted the same type of strategy, right? If you live in the desert, uh, there's a lot of cactus. You start to kind of, I don't know, mimic cactus, develop thorns and spines. Um, and, and that's what these things have done as well. So again, this would be then a little representative of that thorny devil which we're going to cover some more in a bit but yeah real spiky looks like a little miniature dinosaur um so that's the um the idea right and that thorny devil falls under this group that we call the agamids so still very lizard like what you typically consider a lizard um kind of like the guanids but not necessarily in the same continent agamids are going to be primarily African species, uh, Australian species. Um, here's that very sort of uh, well-known frilled lizard. If you watch Jurassic Park, where that lizard kind of flares out, that dinosaur flares out, that is kind of based on this here. Uh, colorful agamids, uh, Chlamydosaurus, the frilled lizard. Uh, these are really neat. Draco, right? Draco are the flying dragons, they call them, right? So uh, medium-sized lizards. You can see them at rest on the tree. Um, if you were to kind of flare out their, their wings, they're basically a flap on the side, and that's the, the wing structure of Draco. So again, giving you a size proportion, long skinny body, uh, these sort of wing flaps. Here's Draco in flight. So you see that the actual hands are extended out. That flap extends out. We even have little uh, cheek fans that also help for stabilization. So neat, neat, neat modification. These uh, these little forest lizards jump, glide from tree to tree. So very, very uh, well adapted to their environments. Uh, there's a Moloch, right? Moloch, that little, just neat looking lizard, the thorny devil. It's the ecological analogous lizard you might want to call it it's the it's australia's version of our horn lizards right they, they they do a lot of things very similar they're not closely uh related phylogenetically they have evolved independently uh, in similar environmental conditions uh deserts uh, harsh you know dry environments um and, and it seems to work right so they're they're neat little creatures uh, on my bucket list. I, I hope one day to be able to find one of these in, in, in life, in nature. Uh, another well-known species, uh, we get into the family now, chameleon today. So chameleons with their rotating independent eye vision, prehensile tails, um, ability to color change based on temperature, on mood. Um, some people used to think that it was for camouflage. Maybe yes, but probably that's not the main um, reason that they're able to color change. Um, they kind of challenge the idea of primates, which we're going to cover later, mammals, humans. We have opposable thumbs, opposable digits. Well, these do too, right? They have two, two sets of digits that kind of... Um, they can clasp and grasp with their little opposable uh, little hands. So opposable digits, not uniquely uh, a characteristic of primates. We see this with these lizards as well. Uh, the tongue. The, the tongue is quite fascinating on how they catch prey. Uh, again, I'll upload some, some videos that will do this more justice, um, showing you the mechanism of how that tongue is, uh, is, is sort of fired out. A little chameleon there. Okay, so we go to uh, a lesser known group. Uh, we're going to call this the Amphisbaniidae. Again, these are not amphibians. Uh, these are either legless lizards or very mo uh, modified, weird sort of snake-like lizards. Right. So this one here is a representative of what we call bipes. Uh, this group also has the we call glass lizards, legless lizards, uh, but these things are wild, right? They look like earthworms, like some sort of 
little segmented little creature. Um, it has front legs, but it has no back legs. So it's very worm-like. It's a lizard with very reduced legs. We don't call it a snake, right? It's, it's a lizard. Um, there's a skull, kind of gruesome little skull on these guys, uh, but really cool. Again, another one of my bucket, li bucket list species. Uh, Got to go to Baja, California to, to find these guys again. Hopefully one day I will uh, be able to you know, experience this little creature in, in life, in nature. Um, another group uh, that you're familiar with, uh, apparently they sell car insurance too. Uh, these are the geckos, right? Geconids. Uh, these have the smallest uh, species of uh, lizards of all the saurian groups. The, the smallest species are found in this group. And so geckos really neat. Uh, modified to many different habitats from desert environments to forest environments. Some live on the ground only. Some are super climbers. Uh, some feed on crickets. Some feed on, on, on nectar. It just depends on the type of species. A lot of diversity here. Uh, common in the pet trade are leopard geckos. Lots of genetic variation that we see on these groups. Um, again, very common pets. Neat little creatures to observe. Uh, just showing you some of the diversity in, in, in feet uh, sort of modifications. And, and form fits function. The type of feet they have gives us an insight as to what kind of biology they, they, they go through, right? How they live, how they hunt, how they ex you know, escape uh, predators. Uh, we have more of the walking, climbing, uh, gripping. Uh, we have the suction, sort of sticking type of, of lamellae, as we call these. So lots of modifications in foot structure. And again, lots of diversity in, in body plan and color. Uh, you can tell here the green ones are forest dwellers, the day geckos, felsuma. Um, this is a newly uh, described species from New Zealand. Um, and then our geckos out here in the desert, right? So our, our little banded geckos, really neat species. The babies, baby Texas banded geckos, and you can find these around here in El Paso, right? You just go out to the desert. It amazes me, some of the harshest environment, pick, you know, pick over some, um, a yucca that's fallen over or sometimes garbage, trash, people go dump stuff out in the desert. Uh, provides now shade for these you know, little micro habitats. Um, and, and you flip these over and you'll see some of these little guys there, right? The babies typically are very clean banded. The younger they are, they're, they're more clean banded. As they start to age, they get more of these little, so we call that modeling within the, their, their, their bands there. Uh, nice, you know, fat tail tells us that it has uh, been eating well. And we may talk a little bit about autotomy a little bit later. Um, but yeah, nice little banded geckos. They look super delicate, but they're quite amazingly hardy to survive our desert conditions out here. Uh, the eyes of the geckos are quite interesting. Right? Some geckos, the eublepharids. So eublepharids are going to have the eyelids. That, they're geckos with eyelids. The actual geckos. Uh, are going to have eyes with no eyelids. I don't know if you've ever seen a lizard lick its eye. Um, those are those uh, geckos that don't have eyelids. So they literally have modified their tongues to be able to kind of do what an eyelid would do. Um, crested geckos, really neat species. Right? Uh, Rachodactylus is a really neat arboreal species that feeds on nectar. Right? They insects and nectivorous type of, of species. Um, they eat uh, fruit. If you have these as pets, you feed them like baby food, uh, that kind of stuff. And I don't know if you've seen the Mandalorian. I don't want to give up anything, but that frog looking creature, uh, they, they call it a frog. To me, it looks more like, like one of these guys. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, yeah. So there's some, some neat, uh, neat species there. Uh, Pygopodids, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but they're showing you then, the lack of eyelids, so using the tongue as a cleaning mechanism. Um, these I showed you a picture of very reduced uh, legs, like little fins, early in the in the presentation. So they're one of these legless groups that live in Australia, or not, not totally legless, little flat legs, 
uh, on their way to being legless possibly. So yeah, so there's Pagopodidae. Uh, you'd have little leg flaps back here, a very reduced little leg flap. Yep, so um, we progress onwards to our skinks, the skincidae, right? And, and these are some examples of the blue tongue skinks. These are Australian, Indonesian type of species. Um, neat, and also again, real smooth. A lot of the uh, other species are very bumpy and rough. The scale structure of the skinks, very, very smooth. Um, smooth to the touch, either way forward or back, right? And these guys are uh, just unique with that blue tongue. Uh, the Cordidillidae's, um, they call these armadillo lizards, very spiky, spiny, uh, common defense mechanism. They bite their tail, so a predator doesn't have an easy way to start from the head or from the tail, so it, it, it spikes all the way around. Uh, very colonial lizard. We don't typically think of lizards as living in colonies, but these do, so neat little groups here, the armadillo lizards. Uh, one of my favorites as well, the what we call the ar arboreal, the tree-dwelling uh, anguids, abronia, and a lot of the, uh, um, just uh, we have the Texas alligator lizard, Geronotus, uh, Elgaria, different types of species here. But yeah, this is wild. You go up to these uh, Mexican rainforests, cloud forests, and in the bromeliads, you, you climb up in the trees and, and the branches, and, and that's where you locate these. So really unique types of species. Oh, okay, one of my favorites here, we get into the Hilodermatids, Hilodermatidae. These are the, um, Hilo, the Gila monsters, beaded lizards. Right? So these are sort of brightly colored and they can back that bright color up kind of like the little poison dart frogs. These are actually venomous lizards. Uh, we don't have very many, very many venomous species of lizards, but these are that type, right? They are a venomous type of lizard, gives you a size comparison. They can get quite large. Uh, typically active at night or uh, during the rainy season, uh, but actually most of the time they're not surface active. Most of the time they spend their, their, their time underground. And again, uh, they are venomous. And even if they weren't venomous, the, you can see a skull here, the, the teeth are quite impressive on these guys right it's even with no venom that that bite you can see the teeth here that bite would hurt very strong jaws very big teeth now you you couple that with on the lower jaw uh venom glands and these little sort of uh, by capillary action the movement of, of venom into the teeth so again, we're going to talk about this later with snakes. Most snakes that are venomous have venom from the top jaw, right? Uh, in the maxillary area. These are going to have venom from the mandible, right? It's not real easy to tell, but you can kind of see a swelling on the lower jaw. Should have got a better picture here, but you can see that swelling on the lower jaw. That's the venom gland. And when they bite, they literally have to chew. And the longer they stay holding, uh, the more venom can sort of seep in via capillary action. So that's one defense. They bite and they're like bulldogs, like, like they just hang on, right? They hang on and the longer they can hang, the more venom is being sort of uh, introduced into that wound. So pretty nasty uh, bite there. And you can see the bite and the venom, venom effect. And again, the venom for these creatures is... Um, more of a defensive venom. So they normally eat uh, creatures they find underground. They'll, they'll eat uh, uh, little baby mice, little baby rabbits. They'll eat, uh, sometimes they, they come up uh, quail, quail eggs. And you don't really need venom when you're eating quail eggs, right? They're, they're not gonna harm you. Uh, they're not easy to, to they're, they're not difficult to, to kill. You just crush them with the strong jaws. So the venom is designed for defensive purposes. And that being said, the venom is, is just pain. It's just radiating pain for like a day, hour, 24 hours, right? It's, um, 
you can see some swelling, right? There is some swelling. Um, the venom is not trying to digest and, and degrade and decompose the, uh, the venom, or I should say the, the prey item, right? So the venom is just um, basically to teach. A coyote would, would you know, a curious coyote would come and try to bite this lizard. This lizard would bite the coyote. The coyote is in agony for a long time, but it doesn't die. But it does learn. Oh, I remember last time I messed with that kind of lizard. Oh, I remember I was in misery for 24 hours. So that's what this venom tries to do. It's not a, a killing, you know, quote unquote killing venom. It's more of a teaching type venom. It's a very painful, um, you know, experience that you will remember and you don't want to go through that again once you passed it one time, right? So the Gila monster venom. So in the United States, we have the reticulated Gila monster. In Arizona, you go up north to Nevada. Uh, Utah, you have these banded forms. Sometimes they're pinky, sometimes they're more uh, yellowish. If we go down to Mexico, we pick up that secondary species of the beaded lizards, which are similar. The beaded lizards are bigger. They are more arboreal. They climb trees more. Uh, they live in more foresty habitat. Uh, so again, nice diversity showing you an adult Gila monster and an adult beaded lizard. Right? Escorpion, they call them in Spanish sometimes. But um, neat, neat creatures. Uh, this is a forest habitat in which you'd find one of these beaded lizards. So uh, just unique form, primitive as far as venom production, but uh, the fact that they do produce venom now takes evolution in a new sort of trajectory, right? Being able to, to manufacture a biochemical naturally that will enhance your survivability. And we're gonna carry that into a, a big trajectory when we get into snakes later. Um, the last of the groups I'm gonna discuss here are the Varanids, the Komodo dragons, the monitor lizards. Um, these are among the, the world's largest lizards. Right? You're talking about 300 pound lizards, you know, uh, nine feet long. They, they, these are big creatures, right? They weigh more than a, you know, an NFL linebacker. They're, they're, they're big. So um, some are smaller, some are arboreal again. Some start out in the trees when they're babies and they kind of, um, you know, these big Komodo dragons hatch in the ground, run up to trees as quickly as they can, mature in the trees. And then when they're big enough, they come down and live on the land. So these are these monitors. Uh, these Komodo dragons are experts at um, killing prey larger than themselves because they, again, have toxic saliva. Two ways, right? One, they have really serrated teeth. In the past, it was thought it was just um, sepsis, a uh, bacterial infection of the blood that they would bite, leave their bacteria, and the bacteria would then overwhelm the body. And that was believed to be the case for many, many years. A few years ago, some researchers actually found very primitive venom glands. So this is a, a secondary um, sort of evolution of a venom sort of strategy. It's different. It's a different strategy of venom production than we see in the, um, in the Gila monsters there. But, but again, I'm just going to say toxic, toxic because of the bacterial load and because now of very primitive venom as well. So when you have these types of um, this, this type of arsenal, this weaponry, you can then take down prey items much larger than yourself, and that's going to feed you for a very, very long time. All right, so let me uh, let me stop this uh, diversity part here, then I'll get into another discussion on lizards, um, and I don't want this to get way, way too long here, right? But let me stop it for a moment here. <laughs>